And we're live. How's it going, Mets fans, Yanks fans, whoever you're a fan of? It's your boy, Wardy. That is Pat Hennessy, and we are here with our debut episode of Bridging the Gap podcast, where you will find weekly shows covering everything Mets, Yanks, especially when the topics have to do with both clubs in particular all off season long. This is not going to be your typical podcast show. We're going to have plenty of banter back and forth. We're going to be interacting with the chat. We want to see these two fan bases showing up in the live shows every single week. We have a plethora of of topics to get into tonight. I mean, it could not have drawn up better for a first episode, Pat. This has been pushed at least a month and a half now that we have been working on this to get this all set up. I'm beyond juiced up. Shout out to every single one of you guys first chime in the live show. But Pat, my man, let's get this rolling, baby. How you doing? Marty, I am so excited. You kind of like described the show perfectly. Like this is a concept that we've had in mind for I want to say like years now at this point, bro. Like when we first did those watch parties back in 2021, who's the captain now, whatever. And now it's like, this has been like months of planning into the show. It's going to be a weekly show talking Yankees baseball, talking Mets baseball. It's going to be a blast, bro. And I'm so excited to get into it. Yeah, and I think the biggest thing I want to emphasize for people that are just new here watching live on a replay, make sure to smash that like and subscribe on if you enjoy not only consistent Mets coverage, but now branching things out a bit, all things New York baseball, which is something that's been long overdue for both of us to get into. But big takeaway for me with this show for people to understand is that, no, this is not going to be a typical format where we're breaking down, getting into all the nit and gritty on the numbers. This is really going to be more of a back and forth showing true fandom one, of course, getting into numbers when it is deemed necessary, but the whole purpose is to really have a good discourse of back and forth and a lot of disagreements as well you know he's a yanks fan at the end of the day he hates the mets yet he, where he's he'll first tell you where he resides doesn't make any sense and i'm a mets fan granted i live outside the philly area doesn't make too much sense either yet i hate the yanks as well so this is gonna be an awesome dynamic pat is not only a great friend of mine but we have worked together in the past if you guys are ogs on the channel then you've seen the watch party live streams we did in the 2021 season between the mets and the yanks they popped off every single time those were the games when Giancarlo and Lindor were going back at it back and forth. That was so much fun. And we're just really, really pumped up to get in this one. So for everyone yeah. first chiming in, thank you so much for being here. And let's get ready to bridge this gap. Yeah. One more thing I do want to yeah. say about the show before we get into the, the real topics is like just regarding the show itself too. Like one thing we really wanted to make clear, even if you're watching on replay, like I think this show is so impactful as a live show. It, it's, it's, I think it's a great idea that we came up with because we got these people in the chat, bro. And we could feed off their comments, come up with new topics based on that too. I love live shows and live content. This is going to be the king of live content, baby. So let's go. Let's lock in, baby. AZ, thank you so much for a $2. Holly says, congratulations on the new series. Thank you so much. And I hope that all you guys watching, wherever you are, end up enjoying this one. But yeah, you've seen the title. We're talking about Brian Cashman. <laughs> what a fantastic job this man has done. Talking about bridging the gap. When talking about bridges, I mean, it felt like you almost burned a bridge before it even started. And that is regarding Yoshinobu Yamamoto's agent that we're about to get into. Because this is a hilarious story. I mean, you got to give credit where credit's due right brian cashman is someone who came out here this offseason said, you said you know what i don't give a, i don't give a damn anymore i really don't with all the media with all the same questions year after year and even though that cashman in in himself is a major factor for the lack of success the yanks have had over the past at minimum half decade if not full decade now he's like you know what i've had enough i'm putting my foot down you know he's getting a little upset and he spoke about a new york yankee who ha struggles to stay on the field who who's that player again pat enlighten me yeah, no. So basically, uh, Brian Cashman took to the media. He's like, you know what? John Carlos Stin, I'm calling you out, bro. Um, he said he was talking about his injuries. It said it kind of just seems to be a part of his game. Um, now, I think this might be something that we might agree with in different contexts. It's like, I think Brian Cashman's a dumbass. And like he hurts the Yankees tremendously. And like you probably agree, but it makes you happy, right? Like yes, you texted very, me the other yes. day. Yeah, exactly. When I think exactly when this quote came out, and you're like, bro, yeah, I love Brian Cashman. And I'm like, yo, you love him for a much different reason. Bro, than I've always been a big Cashman guy. Yeah, but okay, what maybe like I, I was a big I'm Cashman guy back in like dude, I'm fucking with you. I'm being sarcastic. <laughs> Come on, okay. Come on. Regardless, <laughs> Like I think what Brian Cashman's mentality is like coming into this offseason. And I think even viewing it from a perspective that's not a Yankees fan, I think it's so evident that this guy is so entitled and lacking accountability and just seems like he's so out of touch with the current state of Major League Baseball. You know what it kind of feels like? It's like imagine like your grandfather pulling up to a high school basketball game and talking shit to the opposing players. That's what it feels like. <laughs> 
<laughs> Yo, it's like uh, Fury's dad always getting involved oh, well, at the one. pressers, bro. Like, stop. This isn't about you. Like, get out of here, dude. Like, this yeah. is not how it is. So picking fights for no reason, dude. Exactly. And talk about picking fights for no reason. You know, sometimes those things can have consequences. And while, of course, we're being exaggerating here when discussing Yoshinobu Yamamoto and his future, it is kind of hilarious how this is the same agent, not only Giancarlo Stan, in which this agent and Joel Wolf had the following to say in regards to Brian Cashman's rather colorful, interesting comments on John Carlos stands and his lack of health. So I read the context of the entire interview. I think it's a good reminder of all free agents considering signing New York, both foreign and domestic that play for that team. You got to be made of Teflon, both mentally and Teflon, whatever you say, both mentally and physically, because you can never let your guard down even in the off season. So my takeaway from that is you have to be thick skinned to be in NY with the type of media, but not only media, now you have to deal with the G I'm just randomly throwing shots at you beginning of off season, bro. We're not even in December yet. And cash was yeah. like, dude, I freaking hate John Carl Stan. Why? Why did we make that deal? For what reason to eat that contract? Right. And the beauty of it all is that Joel Wolf also represents as we talked previously on the channel, Edwin Diaz, Kodai Senga, and of course, Yoshinobu Yamamoto. Now he represents some Yanks as well. So don't get twisted. I don't expect the relationship to be completely hurt here. But if you want to talk about just, really doing a great job on almost burning a bridge at the worst time possible. Cashman has certainly done his best efforts in that regard. Now, when asked about uh, when Yamamoto was recently asked about the situation, he was unaware. Now he is again, Yamamoto is someone that, you know, we've heard some quotes recently that Pat you'll share with us on, you know, his thoughts on the Yankees to an extent, but one thing's certain, you know, the Mets are all in on this guy and for there to be any potential hiccup with a team also heavily pursuing him, that being Cashman, the Yanks, I mean, you have to be loving that as a Mets fan. I mean, uh, for breakfast, I just that Cashman, please continue to talk, bro. There's no reason to stop just all off season long. When we get into the winter meetings, bro, I want to see him everywhere all the time. He needs to be at every freaking presser. He needs to be on Evan B network. He needs to be on foul territory. He needs to be everywhere. Just l let it loose. Brian, tell us how you really feel. Well, seriously, <laughs> bro. Like, I think the only way to describe him so far this off season is just unhinged. Like, for a lack of a better term, to be honest, <laughs> yeah, like it's, it's weird. But just on the Yamamoto thing, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, this could certainly play a role in Yamamoto, like, choosing what team he's coming to this offseason, right? I mean, obviously, like we said, like, Wolf is also Yamamoto's agent, the, the same guy who had to defend Stan from the GM attacking him on the second week of the offseason. But uh, when asked about, you know, I guess, what, what team he wants to come to, whatever, um, I, I believe, I don't know the exact quote, but apparently Yamamoto's fascinated by the the pride, the tradition, just everything about the New York Yankees. Um, and it's something that, to be honest with you, I kind of don't take into account too often. I kind of view it as like the Yankees organization isn't held at the same stature as it used to be, right? But I think also that's coming from the perspective of, of a Yankees fan, a very like right. disgruntled Yankees fan who hasn't seen his team win a World Series and what? 14 years now at this point but i think we also have to take into account like internationally especially in a place like japan where the yankees have had numerous stars come from whether it's matsui or tanaka or you name it and obviously yamamoto has some sort of feelings there and feelings like there's a funny term but you know what i mean like obviously there's some sort of bias in terms of like yo i want to go to the united states and be a new york yankee for some guys it's significant maybe like Yamamoto, some guys it isn't like Otani where it's like, yo, I just want to be on the West coast. So I think it is going to be interesting to see how this plays out, but also bro, at the end of the day, I don't think Yamamoto is like a be all end all acquisition of the off season for either team, dude. Like maybe that's a hot take, but bro, I think that I'm shit just... is burning my ass as we speak. No, but kidding? hear me out. No, no. Okay. Maybe I'm, like, I'm so... Jesus. That's okay. All right. I yeah. know corny. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that but, was pretty bad. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess the perspective I'm coming from where it's like, I'm a Yankee fan, right? And I'm looking at a team where our main issue is the offense Um, and going out and spending a lot of money on a pitcher who has yet to pitch in MLB. It feels like a little bit more of a risk to me than the Yankees should be willing to take right now. If he was an offensive weapon, sure, because I think like that could totally change the Yankees next season. But I don't know if I'd be like devastated if he happened to sign with the Mets. 
So I'm loving all of this. You know, this the whole point and premise of the show, especially when there's a player that both the Mets and the Yankees are targeting is, is we're supposed to talk shit and basically advocate why this guy's not going to go there, et cetera. But you're really feeding into the idea that Yamamoto is likely going to be with the Mets versus the Yanks. Or at least you don't hate it. It's not the end of the world for you. Because for me, sure. if Yamamoto goes to the Bronx, I'm going to cry like a little bitch for a while. Well, I'm you're a hater. Crying. What? You're a hater. No, it's not just because I'm a hater. I really want this guy. I, I'm I'm enamored with Yoshinobu Yamamoto. I think when you look at the entire free agent class of starting pitching, there's no one better. There's no one with a higher ceiling because the ability to have an ace at the age of 25, mind you, to lock up a long-term deal, even though it'll likely be $200-plus plus million that's still a worthy price to pay, knowing what you're getting. Like, look at the success the Mets had with Kodai Senga in year one. The guy's 30. So just imagine what that potential is when you have – Similar stuff, certainly better, higher ceiling, you know, less innings and work on his arms. So hopefully there's more longevity with his health in his career. There are just so many things to like, especially for us Mets fans that have just had recent success, great success with an MPB pitcher, you know? So that's really where where we stand. We had a lot of question marks with Sango when he first came in. He needed to prove us right, basically, or prove us wrong if we had doubts about him. And he did all that and then some after having a shaky first number of starts because his walk rate would be up and down every now and then but he really got comfortable and again got Cy Young votes in his rookie year which we're all pumped up about as Mets fans but for the Yanks I think there's an argument to be had that they don't need Yamamoto to the same degree when of course you have your offensive holes you also do need to keep in mind do you love the idea of having another starting pitcher with that big of a contract in your rotation we are throwing 100 plus mil per year to your starting rotation like where do you stand on that personally when it comes to the amount of spending you'd be doing assuming that you're hopefully still going to dress offense but like if you get Yamamoto do you still have the same chances of landing to Cody Bellinger like Cashman has yet to prove that so if he's going to talk the talk let's see if he can finally walk the walk yeah, no, I think that's exactly where I'm coming from, right? It's like, I, I'm not extremely confident in Cashman, like, going out, getting Yamamoto, and then doing more, right? So I think that's why I'm not, like, gung-ho on Yamamoto or Boss. But, like, speaking on the Yankees pitching depth right now, let's just, everyone, spam some W's in the chat for your unanimous 2023 American League Cy Young winner, Garrett freaking cold wardy i am asking you to issue a public apology i am not the issue... best pitcher no. in major league baseball no. last season no the last thing i'm ever going to do is acknowledge kermit the frog for anything more than that okay i'm not going to do it congratulations you find i was actually taken back that he won one for the first time i thought cole already had a scion on his resume i know he's gotten scion votes in the past with the astros maybe with the pirates as well that took me back but i just i'm not a garrett cole guy i think he's an ass i think he's a schmuck i'm not gonna lie i, I just i stand by that i really do and really? I, you know what you know what it really stems from and this goes back to when i first started covering the mets in youtube it was learning everything about trevor bauer leading up to those sweepstakes and finding out, at least, again, I can't speak on that entire situation behalf, but, you know, from what I learned, Bauer was really treated like shit with Cole. And, and that is something where you have to wonder who's at more fault there. And if, like, is this is this the type of guy, is he really just being a dickhead because he knows he's an elite arm with UCLA and he can get away with it? Like, I, it didn't sit right, right with me. And on I top of so that, not. he's the most least intimidating person in all baseball. As soon as he shaved that beard, he is just a tall thick schmuck there's nothing back. more to it bro literally it he's squeezing his nuts to get his voice out because of how high pitched he is nah i i'm not, I, bro nah. you wish you were garrick cole of course you, you wish i was garrick cole what kind of okay. fucking sentence is okay, that so you're being a hater i'm yeah but that doesn't mean I'm, dude, okay i'm glad dude, you're no, 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 no. Hater, bro. i can but. shit on a guy i would love to be him because even though that i would look ridiculous i would sound ridiculous i would have a shit ton of money and bro, be he's a beautiful man he's adorable bro go like, kiss him for all i care okay my dream scenario is sitting on garrett cole's couch on a cold december evening while he's making me hot cocoa and he's like patrick would you like the mini marshmallows that's all i'm gonna say bro bro, bro just Stop. Nonsense. Okay. We don't even have Cole cool. on the topic bar, and you got to throw his ass in here. Like, unprofessional, to say the least. We're trying to get off to a hot start with the pod, already off to a cold one. Dave, thank you so much for the $5. Ah, Dave says, what is that your evil twin? He's he's something, all right? A lot of people are saying we look alike. That's some BS. It's just because we're both young. <laughs> we're friends. We have facial hair, and we have hats on that are forward. There is no similarities. <laughs> no, bro. That, bro. We, we kind of look like, like, you know, like in Fairly Odd Parents, there would be like, 
the evil uh, and yes. then like the angel. Yeah, like <laughs> alternate what? universe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I see that. AZ, thank you for the five dollar haul. Says feels like Cashman's too busy just finding terrible trades and unfairly calling out Stan instead of building winners. Yeah, I know it's crazy. It's almost like holding on to the Andujars, the Frasers of the world won't get you far. You know who the fuck would have thought of that? Glaber Torres holding on to him to make sure that he wasn't dealt in a potential Jacob Degrom deal. Like I don't know. Like you know, I digress. Right. Well, now let's get into something that you should be excited about, Pat. And it does kind of piss me off. While Juan Soto is certainly a guy that is in the cards for the Mets, there is no denying that the hype right now is with the Yanks. So lead the way on that front. What is the latest with Juan Soto and these trade sweepstakes? Yeah, so the super latest on Juan Soto. Um, Jeff Passan on, I believe it was the Michael K show today, came out and said Yankees fans should be excited because I think they've got a really good chance of going out and getting Juan Soto. Morty, this is a really big deal. Because you know how I just said, like, Yamamoto isn't my be all end all of the offseason. Like, if the Yankees got Yamamoto, I wouldn't be like, oh my God, right. season saved. Yeah. If the Yankees go out and get Juan Soto, I think this is the only move that they can make this offseason where I would have that feeling that's like rejuvenation. It, it would, it would revive a team where there isn't much to be excited about right now besides Aaron Judge and Garrett Cole, right? It's right. like you, yeah. you add in that spark plug to the offense that's so desperately needed. And obviously, they would still need to do more, right? But Juan Soto to the Yankees changes everything. Um, and one thing I love to compare it to is back a couple of years ago when Bryce Harper was a free agent, right? Like, all the stars were kind of pointing to him being a Yankee. He wanted to be a Yankee. The Yankees had that outfield spot open, and they just didn't pull the trigger, and it's haunting them. Every single year, Harper rakes in the postseason since then. And this is their one opportunity to make right of that situation, right? Because if they pass up on Soto and he goes to, I don't know, bro, somewhere else, let's say he goes to the Mets, it's, it's, it has highly the, it has the potential to be exactly what the Harper case was, where the Yankees are going to regret that for a very long time. And who knows when you're going to have another Soto type generational talent available on the trade market, on the free agent market. So if the Yankees were to make one single move this offseason, I think Juan Soto has to be it. And the exact latest with Juan Soto actually comes from Jeff Passan earlier today, saying how, you know, he firmly believes the Yanks have as great of a shot as ever to pretty much land him, as is the case we've heard with some other reporting over the past month that the Yanks and uh, the Padres look like a potential perfect match for Juan Soto. And <clears throat> to your point, knowing how talented he is, that this is a generational talent that can be deemed in a lot of ways, that even as a rental Knowing that he is available, you have to go all in. And this is a really unique situation now with Peter Seidler's passing. Again, may he rest in peace. I cannot say enough amazing things about Seidler, everything that I've learned, especially from my good friend Borna, who covers the Padres at Hogwatch, you know, a true humanitarian that really brought excitement back and interest back and, you know, a lot of attention to a small market there in San Diego with the Padres. Deserves so much credit for that. But now that they've been uber aggressive over the past two years and they, they haven't had that success knowing Soto is now a rental and you can still get an arm and a like for him it does make a lot of sense to part with him at the right price now the Yanks when looking at the farm certainly they have those pieces and they have more appealing pitching pieces that they, they can part with than the Mets can there's no deny that Mets aren't as deep with their pitching pool right now than the Yanks are but what do the Mets have an upper hand with well one Soto has that familiarity in the NL East. He loves to play at City Field. He's spoken openly about that as well. The Mets have been long connected, like many teams, but the Mets have had interest in Soto for a number of years. They tried heavy at the trade of the line of 2022 to land him. They offered Francisco Alvarez, Brett Beatty, everyone and their mother. And, you know, Mike Rizzo said no, because we're not going to keep him in the division. It's as simple as that. So the Mets landing to Soto, while, of course, it would deplete a good amount of farm, is still that unique exception where you do that knowing you do all you can to extend him and you hope you do the the worst situation is you make that trade he doesn't get extended and he walks that is the big risk here and that is why it wouldn't be shocking if say a Mets team ends up not getting as involved as maybe we initially thought because they rather look once the next offseason hits and they can just throw him a bag he simply can't refuse so the Yanks though my question and I think this is what all Yanks fans question is how willing is Cashman to go there you know, like how, when was the last time that Brian Cashman proved that he's willing to part with multiple high end top prospects in order to get a guy specifically a rental mind you, in which there is still no guarantee at the end of the day, if you're going to extend him long-term. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I think 
if I'm putting myself in Brian Cashman's shoes, let's just say, I think everyone and anyone is on the table. Um, anyone not named Aaron Judge or Garrett Cole, right? But I think it becomes a little bit more difficult when you are Brian Cashman because we know how he operates. And there's so many scenarios in, in Yankee land where the Yankees wait too long to trade somebody and they lose all their value, whatever. Um, but, dude, I think I don't think he has a choice, right? Like, I think he has to be aware. Like I said before, this is a generational talent. And if you want him, you might have to part way, ways with a Jason Dominguez. You might have to part ways with a... a at, uh, uh, Everson Pereira, Oswald Peraza, uh, literally every one of their top five prospects, bro. And you need to think even, to yourself too, I'm sorry to cut you off, but you also need to think even Jason Dominguez, for example, once he returns from injury, if he peaks and becomes this amazing star, even at his peak, is he still going to be Juan Soto level? That's very hard to believe. Very exactly. hard. Exactly. But, but that's my thing too. It's like, I personally, I think the Yankees could easily get the trade done without including Dominguez. Right. But if it came down to it, and the only way the Yankees could get Juan Soto is if they gave up Jason Dominguez. Dude, I'm doing it 10 times out of 10 just because you have to use the logic where it's like, we're lucky if Dominguez becomes Soto ceiling, right? I think that that would be like a really good scenario. So I'm always going to trade the, the prospect for the sure thing any day of the week. But coming from the Mets point of view, I'm intrigued to see like, because I would say the Mets are, the Mets could use Soto, but I don't think it's as much as a necessity as it might be for the Yankees, right? So would you be willing to part ways with just about anyone and everyone like the Yankees would be? Right. No, exactly. And uh, my conclusion on this topic, aside from the Yanks looking like that they truly do have a great shot at landing him is, you know, what's going to be bigger priority, I guess. You know, it, they're heavy in the Cody Bellinger market. They're heavy in the Soto market. It's going to be one or the other. There's, it's. I find it very hard to believe that they would go out, give up the assets for Soto, then also sign a mega contract to Bellinger long term, which is what he's likely going to get after awesome bounce back year with the Cubs, and then also address your rotation. Like that's a lot. I don't think either club, truthfully, is going to completely check every box that they need to do this offseason because they have a lot of boxes to check. But the Yanks are a situation to watch on what is going to be priority number one and do they actually not strike out each time and land one of these big fish that they have been connected to like they are every single year for the Mets and Soto we're going to see what happens on that front and see what the Mets willingness is to part with said prospects and if those prospects the assets the Mets can really give up is enough versus say what the Yanks can offer and what some other clubs can certainly throw out there any final remarks before we get into the next segment yeah, before we get into the next topic, I, I want to make, a, since it's kind of like our, our first episode of the offseason, we know there's going to be a lot of Juan Soto news throughout right. the entire offseason. <laughs> yes. But I think this is the perfect time for us to kind of like play a little game, bro. Let's make a prediction. Uh, do you think Soto gets traded? And if so, where does he get traded to? I'll let you go first. Ooh, it, it's tough. Uh, I'm really 50-50 on if Soto gets dealt. I want to say it's increased after Seidler's passing now. Um, and I don't mean that in, in slight of Seidler in any way. I just think that the circumstances, knowing that the bill of people have known in the industry, like, and of course people in the organization knew that Seidler's health was not great for a while. And as that was starting to come out, so were the Juan Soto trade rumors starting to build up. So I think especially given the current situation that they're in, where they have so much turmoil, they have a place owner of an owner. Literally, that's what they have right now. Um, I'm going to be more on the optimistic end and say that he does get traded. And I don't really know where he's going to go. Um, because truthfully, the Padres, a team. bro, the Padres really, really surprised me when they did the deal. So yeah. <sighs> just pick a team, Marty. I'll say the Yanks. I'll say the Yanks for now. Yeah. And I, and not, okay. And I'm not saying it as a jinx. I'm just saying it because the Yanks are the most connected club currently, reportedly. That's all I'm backing it on. Because yeah. yeah, jinxes aren't real though. I will say they but absolutely I'm gonna agree. are. But go ahead. That's fine. Okay. I'm right. gonna agree that he does get traded, and I'm also gonna agree that the Yankees are the team. Now that's like really blind optimism, bro. Like I, I think it's just I'm speaking it and thinking it into existence. But yes, by the end of the offseason, Juan Soto will be a New York Yankee with a massive extension. Dave with another $5 holla says, Luke Skywalker versus Darth Vader. That's what we love to see. You were the chosen one. <laughs> Thank you so I've much for the donation. 
<laughs> All right, now let's get into the next segment. Uh, before we get into a little bit more on trade topics regarding Manuel Margot, which I know we're all chomping at the bit again, it's just like fucking nobody. Let's get into Carlos Mendoza, the latest managerial hire for the New York Metropolitans. Now, the reason why I bring this up, Pat, is because, you know, he was just your bench boss. He's been in the Yanks organization for the past decade, you know, 15 years plus, actually. And, you know, I've heard nothing but great things about Mendoza. So I want to ask, from a Yanks fan point of view, what was your thought process when you first found out the news that Mendoza was one interviewing with the Mets to being hired and three, what have you heard about him? And I know that you probably don't have too much info because who's studying intensively, uh, you know, a bench boss, but I'm just really curious to know what your stance is on all that when you first found it out. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I- I'd love to see the Yankee fans in the chat, like what they feel about this. Um, Cause I don't know if I'm on the only one that really doesn't care. Um, okay. I think losing a bench coach, like, doesn't really mean much for a team um once again i'm not in the clubhouse though maybe carlos mendoza was the glue of the yankees clubhouse i I mean that's what your boy anthony volpe said that mendoza was the driver in all the team meetings and shit dude like he was the guy we're listening to anthony volpe now come on i mean yeah he clearly knows a thing or two unlike someone i'm talking to go ahead though pat go ahead but yeah no i mean i don't i mean one thing that I, I find kind of interesting is when the Mets made the announcement, like, oh, we hired Carlos Mendoza as manager. There was every single Mets fan in, in the replies, bar was like, yeah, Mendoza, yeah, welcome to New York. Maybe it's just like being optimistic and being welcoming. Right. But it's like, I don't see a reason to be like, yo, this guy's going to be an awesome manager. Um, Obviously, it's like the only time we ever saw him or heard from him was when Boone got ejected one of his 500 times every season. <laughs> But dude, he managed I, I don't know. 24 games for you guys because no, Aaron no, just be freaking such a hothead. Bro. And w- w- one thing I will say is I, I don't remember which season it was before, maybe before 2020 or 2021. Boone had to miss Health like, issues. yeah, he maybe had to miss half of spring training, I think, or quite yeah. a few weeks with uh, the pacemaker issue. Yeah. And Mendoza really stepped up big time. And obviously spring training, not a lot of big managerial decisions are made, but just, I remember the way he handled the media and the way he handled the situation publicly uh, was awesome. So I guess in that regard, like he definitely seems like a a great media presence, um, which at the end of the day, I think a big role for managers nowadays, especially with all the analytics and everything. But yeah, I mean, nice pickup for the Mets. Um, It's not something I would kind of write home about, but I'm, I'd be lying to you if I said I wasn't intrigued to see how he does. Right. I think there's an interest level now because, again, Yanks fans, they unless you're like truly a diehard that's focusing on a lot of the little idiosyncrasies of the game of the team that the average fan doesn't, you know, you didn't know too much about Carlos Mendoza over the years. And that is the same way how some Mets fans were interested to see how Louis Rojas would do as he went to the Yanks as their third base coach. Right. But now I want to get into um, another key thing regarding exactly this and it has to do with a yankee legend by the name of mr october reggie jackson over the past (laughs) week and a half or so came out with with remarks on mendoza that i've already spoken on the channel but i want to hear your opinions on them because there is something to be said here about these remarks and they're the following to the mets and steve cohen you have hired a great person baseball man and manager to be i've known carl's 25 plus years while with the yankees and good to you my friend on the hire i still have the yanks in me but they have let Two great baseball men leave in Rob Thompson and now Carlos Mendoza. And this is a very interesting point because Thompson, of course, a former bench boss for the Yanks as well, has went on and now has had great success with the Phillies since filling in that role for another Yankee manager, no less, former manager, which is pretty funny when you think about that. But, you know, Thompson's done great, and us Mets fans hope that we see similar success that Thompson has done with the Phillies that Mendoza now does here with the Mets. But I want to know, hearing that from Mr. October himself, you know, not trying to really drag the Yanks, but you could tell that maybe there was slight disgruntlement there, you know, just a little eye-opening that, okay, we've had Boone here for so long. We haven't had the success we're looking for. We parted ways with one bench boss. He's already got his team to the dance in the same year that he wasn't initially hired from the start. And then you see here now with Mendoza, in which there's a lot of hype and excitement around, of course, filled with uncertainty. But what's what's your thoughts on all that? Yeah. Um. First of all, I, I'd like to start this off by saying no one should care what Reggie Jackson has no. to say. Um, I'm not sure why his opinion is relevant. I'm not saying I necessarily disagree, right? Like if I had my choice, Aaron Boone wouldn't be the manager of the Yankees, 
But who cares what Reggie Jackson has to say? Maybe it's a little bit like deep rooted for me because I despise Reggie Jackson because when I was seven years old at a car show, I was in line for an autograph signing for Reggie Jackson and I was next in line and he stopped the signing and never came back. So seven-year-old Patrick stood there with his baseball while Reggie Jackson went to go look at cars and he never came back to sign my baseball. So Reggie Jackson, you're a bum. Also, bro, like, He's just known as being Bro, a very... I wish I had better help sponsor for the show, knowing you need this therapy <laughs> session, dude. Like, you need to talk. You told me off air that you hate this guy. I'm like, what? Who the fuck hates Reggie Jackson? <laughs> no, everyone does. <laughs> Holy shit. No, I mean, no, no, no. Enlighten me. I've never I'm... heard good things personally about him at all. I, I can't. I can't speak on that. I have no clue. Also, yeah, yeah. wait, did you? So the MVP ceremony today, they had him announce Otani as the winner. Dude, he went on like a five-minute monologue about himself when he was supposed to be like introducing it to, to well, Otani. Was he pulling the whole like back in my day? Yes. No, he was. Oh. He was. He was. But yeah. Oh, one, I didn't one, see one, it. Once again, oh, Reggie shit. Jackson, bum. I hope Carlos Mendoza does well. Wardy, I, I hope you embrace Carlos Mendoza, but I, I don't know. I dude, I gotta say he had a killer presser, and I know that that only means so much, but it was really refreshing to see someone be unfiltered for the most part. Aside from ask like questions about who's who's gonna be your bench boss, hire things like that, he has to be hush hush about. But he's really genuine, and I loved um, just how passionate, and appreciative he was of the opportunity, like being Venezuelan too, and you know everything that he did to get to this point. I thought was really awesome to hear and. The one thing that really stuck out to me about Mendoza wasn't only just how great he is with players. I've heard nothing but amazing things on that front. And again, including Volpe and other players in the Yanks organization have said great things. But two, his confidence level. You know, one quote that really stood out to me was, you know, this isn't just like an exciting opportunity for Carlos Mendoza, but it also is for the New York Mets. And he also went on to say that while I was interviewed by David Stearns, I asked him just as much, if not more questions that they asked me. I need to know so much about culture and every different aspects of the team. And once that became abundantly clear, what the vision here is and what we currently have, what we're going to have, you know, I felt like a perfect fit, like the right fit and having that respect in New York as is understanding the media market, having managerial experience in the minor league level, having managerial experience at the MLB level with the Yanks of all teams, I can see why he checked off a lot of boxes. And while he's a name that isn't Craig Council, there is also something to be said about those respective pressers. Council looked like he was freaking shaking in his boots in Chicago out here. And that's only Chicago media. You know, that's still not nearly what New York is. So again, on-field product is what is going to matter most. I'm sure Council is going to have a fantastic year with the Cubs. Hopefully Mendoza has a good one with the Mets. But so far, so good. Just intrigued more than anything to see how this rolls out. But let's get into our sure. final topic before we get into answering some questions and then wrapping up our first ever episode of Bridging the Gap podcast. Coming at you live weekly is the goal here. It may, we're, we're aiming to hopefully do the same time and same day every single week. That may change, of course, if anything breaking news happens on the Mets end or if, you know, our schedules just don't align. But that is certainly the goal to be as consistent as we can be. And now let's get into a guy that both the Mets and the Yanks want so bad. Yes, you heard that correctly. Tampa Bay Ray, veteran outfielder, Manuel Margot has at least five teams showing interest over the past week leading up to the Rule 5 draft deadline, which was a couple days ago. Uh, Manuel Margot is certainly a guy that can be dealt this offseason, along with Tyler Glass now for the Rays, just to name two guys there. And the Yanks have shown interest. The Mets, according to Joel Sherman, have had substantial trade talks prior to the deadline already with the Tampa Bay Rays. Now, he has yet to be dealt, but, you know, I want to hear your viewpoint on him. I really I want to know where you stand with this Yanks pursuit, potentially, for a guy that is in your division that you've seen plenty. I want to know what you like, don't like about him. Because for me, I mean, if you watch my video today that came out with breaking the guy down, I think I found one comment out of 100 so far saying they're down for, for Manuel Marco. Everyone's like, who the fuck is that? guy i want nothing to do with them bro this is so well ponds god forbid mind you it's you know it's okay to have a fourth outfielder you know it doesn't mean that that guy's gonna play every day but if that acquisition would be more than a fourth outfielder if he is getting consistent reps all the time then yeah i'm gonna probably be pissed about it because there's nothing to justify manuel margot with both these teams given their lack of um fill uh they still have holes to fill in their outfield regardless of that it's still hard to justify so let's start with you what do you know about Margot? uh watching him playing with the rays and secondly are you in favor or against a yanks pursuit here yeah i mean obviously i mean what we know about Margot, he came up obviously as a top prospect with the padres um and then trade over to tampa was it in the 
It wasn't in the Snell deal, was it? Will Myers deal, maybe? Oh, maybe. Well, I think the Will Myers deal. I might go. I, I think it does go that far. Uh, that back that far. You might, be but right. regardless, you might be right. Uh, his time in Tampa, I would say, has been underwhelming. Without looking at his uh, his back of the baseball card. Well, I'll re- I'll read the stats for you right now, just briefly for fans that aren't aware. Margot this past season uh, had himself thirty nine runs scored, four home runs, a sub seven hundred <laughs> OPS, like a two sixty four <laughs> average. He's in the seventy seventy fifth percentile in speed. He's a solid defender, can play center, can play right, can play left if you need him to. That's why teams have interest in him. It's that ability, of course, to be defensively versatile. One, two, has speed on the bags, and three, hits at a solid contact rate, but there isn't great OBP production there. There is yeah. certainly not slugging. So what is there, right? No, but he's had a couple good offensive seasons in the past, I'm Correct, pretty sure. Correct, but nothing that's yeah. been overwhelming. Like, nothing no. that would really justify warranting him being an everyday player for either team. Platoon, oh, yeah. I, platoon, I can understand stand as a fourth guy and his and his numbers against lefties since 2021 are very good at 300 average um and a solid slug but still you know for what both these teams kind of need and want even fourth outfielder types I, I as a Mets fan you know I would much rather like at Adam Duvall for example you know yeah that's just my no. stance so I, I'm curious what yours is no, yeah, I think it's fair. I mean, AB in the chat just said basically Aaron Hicks. Like, it, it sounds oh God. exactly like Aaron Hicks, um, except he's not a switch hitter. <laughs> but, yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't be mad about it as a fourth outfielder, but knowing how the Yankees operate, they'd bring on Margot, and he'd be, like, leading off by the end of April, and he would be their everyday center fielder <laughs> until Dominguez comes right, back. Right, you know because that's, I mean? that's and, how the Yanks operate. Yeah, they, they would yeah. view him as like a, a, a low-risk, high-reward type thing. Yeah, yeah, Meanwhile, yeah. the Rays are just dumping him on us. Um, So, I mean, like I said, fourth outfielder, cool. But as a starting center fielder, like, no, bro. And also, at the end of the day, if we're looking at him as a fourth outfielder, there's quite a few guys out there that I would prefer over Margo. It's like, yo, give me Kevin Kiermeyer as the fourth outfielder. Give me Jason Hayward as a fourth outfielder. Give me literally anyone else besides Manuel Margo. It's crazy that we're in a world... Or in 2023, you just said you'd rather have Jason Hayward. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Here? Manuel Marco. It's insane. But here's the thing I, I would actually probably disagree with that. And the reason being is the Dodgers always make something out of nothing. You know, Jason was a shell of what he once was for a major, like a good chunk of that uh, contract with the Cubs. You know, so once he was parted with, goes the Dodgers. You know, the Dodgers they just they work with what they have, and that that's what makes yeah. them so good. And that's they do so well with their analytics department. It's something that the Yanks have a lot of work to do. Apparently, Cashman freaking bragging out here. You know, we're you know like we're one of the lower teams of baseball in analytics. What you want a fucking cookie? You think that's a good thing, bro? You know the amount well, no, of- but also. It's a lie. Like the like the 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 numbers prove that the Yankees have like one of the biggest analytics departments in the league. But how is that a lie if the man himself is saying it? I don't know why he's lying. <laughs> he's a I liar. I know. Like you literally, they didn't he have like a firm come in not long ago to like over yeah. like look their yeah. analytics department if they're running things like what properly? Like who the f- bro? Who he's does unhinged. That? He's unhinged. He is unhinged. Yeah. Which is why he's perfect for you as your GM. He is exactly what the Yankees have been needing this entire time. Dave, thank you so much for five dollars. Dave says, "Sorry, Pat. Mets will get Yamamoto. You don't have George anymore." Thank you, Dave, for the donation. As always, I tend to agree, but we'll see what happens. Pat, again, it's not the end. I'll be y'all. Let us have Yoshi. You know, if you get Soto, I'll be pissed about it. But that's a fair trade. I'll be happy with Yoshi. Like honestly, if that's yeah. how it's gonna go, if we're both gonna have a big splash, like I'm, I'm content with that. Yo. Can, can we, like, shake on something virtually? Yes. So- Team Wardy down with the Evil Empire. Thank you for the donation, Josh. Josh is a Brace fan, and his girl is a Mets fan. Gotta love the dynamic in that household. Thank you, Josh, That's for the donation. Uh, but what, um, what, what, were, what are we virtually doing right now? Yeah. So if the, if the Mets sign Yamamoto, I would love to see you attend opening day in a Yoshi costume. You know, like Yoshi from, from Super Mario? I, I can do the Yoshi voice to a T. Do it. I didn't know Yoshi spoke, but yeah. Okay, ready? I don't know why. There's a couple characters I can do well. Stitch, I can do solid. Kermit, I mean, all I need to do is just look up Garrett Cole and just listen to him for two minutes. But I can do Yoshi too, right? Yoshi! Listen to that. That's fucking money. Money. That is Yoshi. And I will dress up as him, bro, without a problem on opening day if they land him. All right, do Stitch. No, no, do Stitch. Bro, just do it. 
please. No, no. Please, no, please. No, I can't. Next I episode? Can't. I can't. Next episode. And next episode, if you remind me, okay. I will. Okay. All right. Great. And honestly, that was kind of a weak one. That was like a six out of ten. I could have did an eight out of ten. But anyways, Manuel Margot, if the Mets land him, you know, I'm going to embrace him and hope that he's a fourth outfielder and hits against lefties in a platoon role at best and is versatile later in the game for defensive replacement, things of that nature. Um, if he's with the Yanks, I hope he's playing every single day. Um, <laughs> yeah, buddy. I don't know what else to say on that front. I really don't. It's just kind of interesting. I will say this final remark regarding this. You're paying $10 million for Manuel Margot to potentially be a fourth outfielder. Do you make that decision without potentially pairing a Tyler Glass now on with you? That's my big question I have. Could the Mets be involved here? Could the Yanks have been involved or all these teams because they're trying to see a pairing with Glass now looking like he's a thousand percent certain going to be dealt this offseason? That is my big question. As Pat just decided to dip, let's see if Pat is actually in here or not. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Shawan, what Pat? Are you there? No, I'm here. Okay, you, you, you I did it. No, no, you dipped for me at least. But did you hear what I was saying or no? Yeah, I heard you. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah. A any any final things on that before we get to some comments? No, I'm just done talking about Manuel Margot. <laughs> <laughs> <Don't>. <laughs> guys, if you haven't already, as we're 40 minutes in, and just so you guys know, our goal for these shows is usually do a hard cap around the half hour mark. Tonight was a little bit more long winded because it's a debut episode. And of course, if we're having fun, we're not going to just stop it short for the sake of stopping short. But for people on replay, we appreciate you watching to this point as well. Make sure to smash that like and subscribe on. And Pat, where can people find you as well for those that don't know you just in advance, both on YouTube and socials? Yeah, uh, YouTube, uh, Unhinged Patrick. I'm trying to post on there consistently, but bro, like it's it's tough. I will say, um, but like once the season gets back started, I want to get back to like my my post game live streams and whatnot. Um, Twitter down below, Unhinged Patrick. Instagram at True Hennessy Wardy. Let's answer some questions, dude. All right, guys, we're gonna open up a Q and A segment for the next four to five minutes before we get out of here. And again, appreciate everyone that's been chiming in. Uh, Mets and Yanks sleeping on KBO star Jun Hu Lee now. Great comment here because I don't think the Mets are sleeping on him at all, as I don't think that they really have a whole lot of interest. As talented as Jun Huli is, who I've done a little bit of my due diligence on this offseason, uh, most talented player coming over from the KBO this offseason, it looks like. He's a slap hitter. He's a contact guy, doesn't really have that power ability. And as a Mets fan who's definitely loved the Mets hitting for contact in recent years, They've gone nowhere with it at the same time. Home runs have proven it certainly uh, trump all those things when it matters most. And I think when you look at the current outfield market, when you look at the outfield market next year, uh, there's just not enough to justify, in my mind, for the Mets to be going out of their way for this guy uh, when they certainly need to upgrade in areas in which he's not really helping with, if that makes sense. What about yeah. you in regards to uh, John Lee? Yeah, I'm going to be honest, like, all I know is what you just said about him. You don't know a fucking um, lick about the dude, do you? Yeah, no. No, I'm not going to act like I do. That's just okay. not yet. Fair. No, that's fine. fine. That's fine. <laughs> don't 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 talk if you don't know, right? I yeah. think that's an important thing to do. I feel like that's an issue with today's sports radio. You know, talk about every sport, every topic, acting like you have a damn clue when, bro, you didn't even watch one game last night. I don't want to hear your nonsense. You know who you are, right? That's the difference between this show. Wardy's and firing show. shots. <laughs> okay. Let's get into some comments before we get out of here. Resign fam. I don't think that's going to happen. I do love Tommy though. Like I freaking love Tommy fam. Huge fan. He kind of Tommy. seems like a douche. Not nah, bro. He, he might be. And I'm not going to lie. Um, I did have the chance. I met him when I was in San Diego. I didn't tweet it out or anything like that because I didn't. I didn't want to be blown up or anything. It was just a quick thing. I saw him. I introduced myself. and That was that. He was a nice guy, but very like just exactly kind of what you would expect. You know, blunt, you know, straight face, just going about his business. And yeah, Tommy really had things rough com uh, coming up. And it really makes sense with kind of how he goes about himself. But more than anything, he's just a really, really smart like people don't realize just how smart the guy is. He's he when he does interviews, like he'll sit there and make sure he's recording too, so that way no one tries to misquote him because he's not misspeaking at all. Yes, he's blonde that. and yes, he doesn't have a filter, but he's very much an advocate to be the best player you could possibly be. He said how there were Mets position players that were the 
worst work work ethic type guys he's ever worked with. He was ta- singling out a couple players. I don't know exactly who they are. There's been some rumors with that, but you know, gave credit to Lindor, Alonso, and others for their work ethic. But just said how you know this isn't a slight on the Mets, but just the Diamondbacks here are thriving so well because they have young kids that are hungry that have yet to hit their peak in their careers. You know, they're just getting started. It's a different feel. Like there wasn't any of that drive with the Mets in the clubhouse. You know, in the locker room, just wasn't the same. So yeah. I think when you look at Tommy Pham, while of course the Jock Peterson is is something you can make note of um the unfortunate situation he had in san diego no less when he had uh when he was stabbed um outside of a club uh not the best thing to happen yeah he literally almost was paralyzed got stabbed a shit ton of times in his lower back right across literally like completely split when he was in san diego the fact that the guy is even playing let alone at the clip he is right now is a cool. miracle and he'll be the first to tell you that insane stuff so yeah besides tommy being blunt not having to filter which can cause issues at times he seems like a really really good human being and i have nothing but good things to say about him Shout out. And, I and was that's wrong. changed a lot changed a lot i when the mets sign him i was just believing the stereotypes but once we were able to learn more about him and really see these one-on-one interviews it definitely st- stuck out to me quite a bit um Yes, fam did uh, did slap Jock Pearson over fantasy. Yes, <laughs> like it was yesterday. I feel like I saw that. I was like, what, <laughs> bro? Like the TMZ clip with the freaking watermarks on it, corner outfield, left field, bro. Jock's is like, hey, what's up, dude? Fucking <laughs> bitch, like, dude. A I year ago, bro. A year, year ago. A year ago, you talked shit and fancy me, bro. I told you next time I'd see you, I'd bit slap you. And he said, it was a year since since I saw him. But, you know, my mindset didn't change. So I don't know what made you think yours did. Uh, Do we got any comments in here before we get out of here? Um, Let's see. Did he hear Patrick is doing uh, teach after this? Bro, it's not even English, dude. What does that mean? what What is that? What is that? I don't understand. What are we talking about? Pat, as a Yankee guy, does Alonzo resign with the Mets? Oh. I think that's a great question. Coming question. from like, because I would assume Kevin, it's kind number. of like a, it's like a Aaron Judge question for you, right? Like, yeah, obviously they're going to do it. But I think that like, there's a chance Pete Alonzo hits the free agent market, right? Because what, what is he, a free agent after next season? Yeah. Okay. So Just if, like I had to, if I had to predict... I would say Alonzo resigns with the Mets. I think that he's kind of just such a big piece to that organization. It goes beyond like on the field, right? Like he he's essentially the captain of the Mets. So I'd be shocked if he does go. Right. Thank you. Wow. That's, that's nice to hear. Hopefully. Uh, I don't like else, him. I know. But, I know yeah. you don't. Um, here, someone said in the chat before we get out of here, Cashman just talked about Joel Wolf's comments. SNY Yankees posted the video. Let's see if we can pull it up right now. Is there a live beef? Bro, I don't know. Let's find this out. Brian Cashman what? said he his conversations with John Carl San Joel Wolf, and they're in a good spot. I was surprised how it got twisted and turned how it played out. I said what I said, so that's why I had those conversations. Bro, what what are you twisting? You just fucking said that the He's guys broke. hurt every year. Like, which is true. You're not wrong. I, I like to make something abundantly clear. Cashman didn't see anything wrong, but it's the fact that you're not a fan, bro. You're literally the GM. Yeah, but the also GM, it's like, like you can't like it's different, you know, like, he loves playing the victim. And like, this is like the definition of like, bro, you're twisting my words. You know what I mean? It's dumb. Whatever. He's definitely the type of guy to get like a scratch on him and think it's the worst thing. Like think of Step Brothers when Wolf. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I'm like <laughs> slightly cut. And he's like freaking out. He's like, oh, man, that's a big, like, you know, he's just got a yeah. freaking uh, little. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it. I'll leave it. I, there's things I could say I won't say, but I think I think this is a good conclusion. Um, final comment that we'll get to here. Good question from Wicked. Which is the bigger need, so the Yanks or Yamamoto to the Mets? That's a great question, and it's it's of course subjective. I will first tell you I think Yamamoto is more of a need because of how desperate the Mets need not only rotation help, but another like big piece like this would really help propel them not only for next year but going forward. But at the same time. For the Yanks, a Soto bat has been unbelievably missing for Judge's entire tenure. Because, in part, Giancarlo cannot stay on the field. And when he is, he's striking out, like, every freaking second. So, I think there's a fair argument both ways. But I I think, I don't know. There's a certain desperation level with the Yanks right now that, you know, I I think they really need to figure shit out 
for their yeah. sake. Like how much of a leash is Ca- like how much of a leash do you think Cashman is going to get here? Do you think that he's like locked in for life? That he just, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. why he doesn't it's give a shit? lifetime deal. Yeah, I think that's what it is. Okay. But yeah, no, I I'd agree. I would probably say w- with my Yankee bias taken into account, I would probably say Soto is more uh, impactful, more necessary. Okay, fair enough. All right. All right, guys, I think that's going to conclude it. I want to thank you all so much again for watching live on a replay for the first ever episode of Bridging the Gap podcast. Now, if you enjoyed the content, please make sure to smash those buttons. Make sure to check out Pat on Twitter, on his YouTube channel, Unhinged Pat as well. Unhinged Patrick, I should say. And stay tuned. We will be back at it next week, if not sooner. And man, oh, man, just fantastic first episode. Had so much fun and really, really excited to kind of have this friendly banter now between these two teams. It's been long overdue. It feels nice to talk about them both while we're not in season as well when we only get so little opportunities you know like this was inevitably going to be happening i'm really excited and happy that it has so again appreciate everyone for the support pat you're a beauty uh final remarks yeah no i'm just i'm i'm extremely happy that episode one is in the books everyone in the chat you guys could screenshot this moment because this will go down as history you were in the chat for episode one of bridging the gap with wardy with pat that's all i got